Excellent. All right. We're letting all the participants in now. I love that ticker. Keep going, keep going. Look at that. Beautiful. Wonderful. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, this month's uh, Greatest Hits webinar is uh, Logistics in America, D uh, the TMS WMS Buyer's Guide. And uh, we're really excited about it. This is... Uh, I think our uh, ninth webinar in six months. It's been a, a heck of a season. And this is the last one we're doing. We're going to take the summer off and come back in the fall. And uh, so uh, before we jump in, as you guys all know, the information discussed in this session represents the views of the individuals and does not constitute legal advice. You should consult with the organization's leadership and legal counsel if you have any questions. Speaking of questions, please note that everybody is muted. So feel free to use the chat or the Q&A icon, and we will go ahead and take those as we are going through. So for today, uh, I will be your moderator, uh, as well as adding color commentary and hopefully a, a couple of good laughs. Uh, Michael Woolwin, believe it or not, I have just celebrated my 30th year. Now I know I'm old. Uh, I was just saying that I was at the Work National Conference this week. And it was um, work back in 1993 that gave me a, a scholarship. And uh, I've been involved in the organization ever since. Um, this year's attendance was 550 people. Uh, when I was on the work board and responsible for the committee pre-pandemic, uh, we used to see 1,000 to 1,200 participants. So I think we're getting back to 550. Uh, with us today, we've got Brad Forrester, very similar background, and Brad will get into his background and a little bit about his company, JBF. And then I'm blessed to have with us Greg Utter with Alpine Supply Chain. And you want to talk about been there, done that, got the t-shirt with regards to WMS. Uh, Greg is the man. So let's see what we're going to cover today. So we're going to talk about the WMS TMS Buyer's Guide. And if you think about it, you've got space, equipment, labor, and control inside the four walls for the WMS and outside the four walls is the TMS. And believe it or not, how the transportation integrates with the WMS can have a significant impact on how the facilities run. So let's hear a little bit more about the TMS side from Brad. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And hopefully some of the uh, uh, the participants here on, on the call will have some good questions for us with regards to some of those TMS and WMS uh, overlaps and synergies. Um, uh, there's, there's no shortage of uh, opportunities there. Yeah. Uh, but just to give a little background as, as Michael teed me up, um, uh, we've recently celebrated our 20th anniversary. JBF turned 20 in uh, May of this year. Uh, so we've been doing pretty much exclusively logistics and transportation technology strategy and implementation for, for shippers and 3PLs since uh, 2003. Uh, prior to that, I had uh, years in operations, uh, both on the carrier side and the shipper side, uh, as well as uh, about five years in, in software. So our, our business at, at JBF is, is really focused on TMS, but that includes a lot of different things. Um, we're, we're exclusively focused on shippers and 3PLs, so not, uh, not trucking companies or, or transport providers, uh, but the, the enterprises that are, that are moving freight, moving product, uh, um, and, and buying capacity. So we, we do a lot of work with transportation management systems, which is pretty obvious, uh, but we also do a lot of private fleet management systems, yard systems, visibility applications, parcel, uh, et cetera. Some of the places where there's some uh, overlap, uh, yard management and, uh, you know, kind of dock and appointment scheduling, parcel system, sometimes those are WMS and sometimes those are TMS. And I think that's that's part of, uh, part of the overlaps. And I'm sure we'll get into some of those touch points later today. Uh, but these are really the functions and the, the different application domains uh, that we play in and that we find most of our, our shipper clients are looking for technology solutions for these types of problems. Michael, and next unsolicited, slide. Yeah, unsolicited, I'll tell you what, man, JBF team, I mean, 
we've got a couple of routing opportunities. We're working with them. You want to talk about world-class, absolutely wonderful. And uh, we're really uh, excited to have a partnership with you guys from that perspective. Thank you. All right, Greg. So inside the four walls, space equipment, labor control, how's the WMS going to help us there? I appreciate it. And thanks for the intro, Michael. Yeah, I've been doing it about uh, 40 years now, close to that, pushing 40 years. So uh, been in a lot of places, probably walked three or 400 at least different distribution centers. And surprisingly, every one of them are a little bit different. But what's common amongst all of them is the necessity for uh, a WMS. It doesn't matter the size. It doesn't matter the complexity. To, in today's world, inventory accuracy is key, as well as the other attributes that Michael mentioned. So what we look at within the four walls kind of at a snapshot is a WMS providing the types of functionality that are listed on this slide from receiving through shipping. And then in the middle of it are all the things that are the strategic places that WMSs provide. So we look at it from a holistic view to make sure that when we're looking at a WMS application, it can meet or exceed not only the current customer requirements, but the future customer requirements to make sure that they're getting the bang for their buck from the asset that they're going to pay for this is usually a 10 to 15 year uh, venture for a project before they start looking elsewhere. Wonderful. All right. So we got a foundation. We know what TMS is and we know what WMS is, but boy, oh boy, this is a little dated and it's only gotten more complex. So this is from um, 2021. And the key takeaway is, you know, selections are not easy. Due to Gartner's Magic Quadrant, um, looking at all the venture capital money that's being poured into this space, supply chain execution is at the top of everybody's list. You know, global disruption, uh, you know, a great market, a great segment to go into. So, you know, what we want to make sure is that if we are going to go and do the selection, understand it's not easy. There's a lot of vendors out there. And as Greg mentioned, even in a WMS, you receive store pickback ship, but what's unique for your operation and which vendor has that? And again, you know, with Brad, do we do routing? Do we do yard management? Do we do appointment scheduling? Are we doing LTL? Are we doing international? Are we doing, you know, TL? Believe it or not, some of the vendors are good in some areas and not good in others. And you might need a hybrid of both to address your needs. So understanding and getting that selection, it's 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 not a, not an easy feat. So. Now that we understand that, Brad, let's talk about how can we be successful in really looking at and installing a transportation management solution? Sure. So when when we first started uh, at JBF, when I first started uh, also as a, as a consultant, um, I was amazed by how many instances I went into a new client uh, to do an implementation and through you know, however many months working with the client determined that, you know, this isn't a great solution for you. And really when we started JBF and, and after a few iterations, we, we really said, uh, we wanna get ahead of our customers making these decisions because this is where we can really influence and shape uh, uh, the best outcome for our clients. It is really easy with all the vendors, Michael, that you just showed on the previous slide, um, <clears throat> many of them say that they're TMSs, right? There's a, a brokerage TMS and there's a, a trucking company TMS and there's a shipper TMS and a parcel TMS. And it's really challenging and complex for our clients to understand what they need, uh, especially if you're in a very diverse, uh, constantly changing fluid environment from a macro perspective. Um, if you have e-commerce, if you have a brokerage operation, if you have a private fleet and you use contract carriage, um, maybe you have four different TMS solutions that you need, or maybe it's just one. So what we really want to do is improve the outcomes for our clients by just re-architecting the process with a, a better mousetrap approach. So this, what we call blueprint, uh, is really around creating a conceptual design for our clients that says, Here's the platform of the future, what we call desired end state. And, and really the desired end state and the blueprint process for us is really taking typically implementation level deliverables, pulling them upstream ahead of the vendor selection so that we can reduce risk, we can improve precision in terms of our project planning, ROI, 
um, scoping, et cetera, the things that cost a lot of money, and obviously improve the vendor fit for our strategic and tactical requirements uh, to improve the outcome of a successful implementation with a, a strong business case and ROI. So I won't go through the methodology, but it's roughly uh, you know, a, a linear sequential process. We do a conceptual design uh, to start. We gather requirements, both bottom up, current state, top down, future state, strategic, where do we wanna be 10 years from now? And we put all those things together to find the best vendor fit. And then we begin to make sure that we're ready to begin the implementation. So, if you go to the next, go ahead. Yeah, what I was gonna say is, you know, I mean, so when we started first working together, I think the big thing for me that I really like the aha, right? So we've been doing WMS selections, labor management selections, but working with you and your team, this whole conceptual design, can you double click on that? Maybe talk a little bit more about what that is. Sure. Yeah. So the, the conceptual design, as you see in that, in the second uh, picture from left, it, it's a very small picture. Uh, I'm happy to double click into this if if any of the participants on the on the webinar here want more details. But really, a conceptual design could be thought of as a as a one page uh, system landscape map. Uh, here's here are the key functions that we want to do. Here's our existing legacy technology or our to be legacy uh, uh, you know forthcoming technology that supports this uh, logistics function. Here's how all the pieces will fit together. We, we do a lot of work there, developing a conceptual design, uh, both a, a visual and, and also building requirements uh, uh, from, from the bottoms up so that our, our customers, before we go to vendor selection, have a clear picture of which are the specific functions that we need to, to go out to market and potentially RFP. Because it may not just be one. We may not just need a, a domestic TMS, maybe we have international or we need visibility or we need a yard system. And I think those are some of the surprises going through the blueprint process that our, our clients have, have relayed back to us is that they didn't understand what they really needed. They just had a conceptual view of uh, kind of what the strategic capabilities would be uh, needed. And they just assumed that it was uh, serviced by a single vendor or you know whoever's in the top tier upper right-hand quadrant of, uh, of Gartner's, uh, Gartner's magic, magic Square. So that's really what the conceptual design is there to do. Typically, it's something that doesn't get put together until the implementation begins. But we really think the best approach here is to put it ahead of the vendor selection because it really helps us dial in how many integrations do we have to do? Where are the biggest gaps? Where are our software vendors going to have to close those gaps with enhancements or mods? Um, what are the biggest places of change from a, from a people standpoint or a process perspective? Knowing all of those elements from the conceptual design and through the blueprint process really help us give a high quality, very precise implementation estimate that ties directly into how much is the implementation going to consume your business case or your ROI? How long is it gonna take? How should we kind of pare it down if it's too costly relative to the budget or the capital that we have to spend? So it really helps our clients be in better control over the situation of the implementation and vendor selection, as opposed to the vendor selection or the implementation driving and, and causing a whole bunch of churn, project delays, capital outlay, project cost increases and things like that. So we really want to help just improve the outcomes from a delivery perspective by doing this. I, I'm a huge fan of thinking with the end in mind and being able to understand the size and the scope of the integration work up front, um, huge, right? Because every TMS yep. project I've ever been involved with, the integration is the most complex and challenging. Yep, definitely. Fantastic. And I would also, right, I would, no, I would ahead, also say on that, on that last slide that you could you could find and replace TMS with WMS and, and come out with the same result, right? So the upfront activities, the business requirements, the conceptual design ahead of that vendor selection is key. Yep, I agree. So very similar to the TMS blueprint, there's, you know, there's a WMS blueprint. And, and like Brad said, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening all at once, right? So 
most companies haven't been through a WMS selection. A lot of the companies that we're dealing with are working with an asset that they've had 15 to 20 years. There may be still some original folks there, but most of them have left and it's, it's a new crowd of folks. So they haven't been through the process. So educating them and giving them the expertise to understand what they're getting into and stop, you know, starting at leadership. Again, building the business case. Why are we doing this? Is it cost avoidance? Is it to stay current? Is it to replace an old asset? So all those decisions have to be made. And oftentimes the business reason isn't a return on investment for acquiring a new asset. It may be a direct replacement of an asset that's working pretty well, but the technology is old. So you have to set that stage and you have to set the expectations clearly. Uh, one of the call outs here under a strategy, you know, we talk about what we're trying to do and we plan for the processes, the organizational, the organizational change management, but we find more often than not that the companies that we're dealing with don't have the internal wherewithal to stand this up on their own, right? So most everybody's got a day job. And what we look at is, do you have the people on staff and on board who are willing to do this without being voluntold that this is a long project, right? So if they do have the bench strength, they probably have too many people on staff. So that client side responsibility is a key part of any implementation, whether it's WMS or TMS. Ask yourselves, do I have the internal wherewithal and the staff to effectively do this implementation? And then clearly it's the, it's the execute, right? Where the rubber meets the road, it's go live, it's the big day, it's game day, everything that everybody's re prepared for. Greg, you know, we're talking about the blueprint and putting this all together. You know, one of the things that we're starting to see is, you know, how does the WMS install fit within an organization's technology roadmap? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. And that's a question that we really have to look at hard and fast. And it's going to lead into the, uh, one of the upcoming slides is what is their technology today and what does it look like? Have they made the jump from... A, a, an on-prem solution to a cloud solution. And if they haven't, why not? And if they don't not, they, if they don't want to, why not? So that's a long conversation. And I would tell you today, there are still some vendors that offer both, but what we're seeing more and more from the WMS side is there are fewer and fewer that are offering an on-prem solution anymore. But you, you and your team right now, you guys are installing eight different WMS projects, how many of those are inclusive of a 3PL as well, or a, um, an ERP as well? I would say it's probably half and half where they're doing both at once. And that provides in and of itself more danger, right? More things that you have to look at. And what we really are, want to try to decide and look at is how does one influence the other and which should come first? right? Is it, the, is it the horse leading the trailer or is it the trailer pushing the horses? So that's a business decision that has to happen early in the process. So you're not number one over or understaffing it and underestimating the time that it takes to stand up one solution as opposed to the other. The dynamic behind it is seeing where am I going to get the biggest bang for the buck? And I can tell you without pause, more often than not, standing up the WMS before the ERP is your bigger bang for the buck. But again, there are sometimes business reasons where they want to do both of them at the same time. And I would tell you, standing up a TMS is quicker, faster, and better ROI than a WMS and then a WMS before the ERP. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see that. So, okay, tell them what you're going to tell them. So we talked about WMS and TMS. Now we talked about kind of our approach to doing it. Now let's get into the advantages and disadvantages of cloud solutions. And again, for those of you that just joined, please use the chat or the QA and we'll try and address it real time. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take this one, Michael. Um, so I think uh, from a TMS perspective, probably, uh, well, it, it may be unlike WMS, right? Which probably still has, uh, uh, a prevalence of on-premise uh, installations. Uh, TMS options today are, are by and large uh, all cloud. Uh, I can't think of really one uh, enterprise TMS vendor that has a, uh, a license model or will uh, uh, sell a license to a, a shipper uh, for an on-premise implementation. They're all cloud, they all want subscription revenue, 
Uh, most of the vendors are charging clients uh, based on FUM, that's freight under management, and it's a, a percentage of whatever your freight spend is, so that uh, if you're growing, uh, your costs will increase, uh, uh, not necessarily linearly, but um, they will cost as, as, your, uh, as your freight spend increases or decreases. Some advantages that we see with with cloud specifically are, you know, it's lower cost, lower barriers to entry, especially if you're a smaller, medium sized shipper. Um, you don't have the capital outlay. You don't have to buy the servers and the network infrastructure, uh, the app servers, the web servers, the database servers, et cetera. All of that is kind of neatly packaged, uh, typically by the software vendor. Uh, with that, you typically get more frequent upgrades, right? So if you're on a cloud solution, your tier one, tier two TMSs are likely going to give you anywhere from uh, two or three on average uh, updates and upgrades per year. Um, and in some cases, even more, right? If, if you're on a new uh, uh, native web platform, maybe of a TMS that's just been released in the past five years, We've seen some give up to uh, monthly upgrades and monthly updates. So that's a nice benefit, especially if you're looking to take advantage of a crawl, walk, run approach and get uh, additional feature function over a period of time. Improved scalability is also a big benefit. Uh, it is far easier uh, to scale up uh, uh, from a volume and a transaction count perspective when you're on somebody else's cloud as opposed to adding servers yourself or going through that kind of rigor. Um, it's, it's much easier for them to scale because they've architected everything to do that. <clears throat> there is a benefit to some integration functionality through open APIs. Uh, they're not closed systems as much as they used to be anymore with flat file integration, APIs making it a little bit easier to get in and out of different systems and hooking them up together to talk. Um, so there's a little benefit there and generally lower startup cost. But interestingly enough, one of the disadvantages is more frequent upgrades. And we, we're seeing a lot of clients kind of struggle with the new reality of having to constantly do upgrades, regression testing, produce you know, training updates. Hey, my UI has changed. My paperclip is no longer on the top. It's on the bottom now. Uh, how do I how do I attach something to an email, right? We maybe have all experienced that with Outlook or Gmail, uh, et cetera. But just think about this at an enterprise scale, uh, when you have a, a transportation system with uh, 35 different front ends to it, something changes and all of a sudden you can't do your load planning. You don't know how to do it. So there's a constant perpetual update cycle that some clients are, are finding to be disadvantageous. Data access and ownership is also problematic, but the software vendors are starting to improve access uh, to data. On-premise systems are super simple uh, to just, you know, have replicated systems, make huge data pulls, SQL queries, et cetera, to get the information out, put it into a data lake or some sort of uh, data repository. Uh, when you're in the cloud and you're in somebody else's cloud, most of that stuff is is kind of off limits. Um, so they're beginning to improve uh, access to data, but it's still challenging and in some cases costly for clients to get access to historic information and, and big data pools from these cloud applications. And I think a couple of the other quick and easy ones are you've got to go through somebody else's help desk to get normal stuff taken care of. It's not your company that's giving you that help desk support. It's the software vendor. So just think about that. And then uh, multi-tenant cloud specifically, where we have a single code base that is essentially uh, every user of that uh, application is using the same code base, just in a different container. Um, that really restricts the, the end user's ability to do things like customizations and mods. So that's why another reason why I think you, you probably don't see it as much on the WMS side where there's a lot more mods, there's a lot more custom enhancements to the base code that we don't really see on the TMS side anymore. So just a, a couple key takeaways here. We're almost exclusively cloud-based on, on transportation log tech in 2023. 
We need to pay attention though to specific architectures and make sure we're not getting into technical debt. Don't purchase client server anymore, right? Because there's a high probability that that software vendor is gonna have to update it. Uh, and therefore that's a, a, a big risk, a big transition item for our clients that costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time to, to redo things. Um, and uh, there, there are significant financial risks if you get it wrong, right? So do your homework up front, do the due diligence. It's a, it's a, it's a great insurance policy and it's, it's very pragmatic and cost-effective. Yeah, I mean, I definitely uh, been in the industry a while. Cloud in 2000 for transportation management was, you know, uh, prevalent. And then within the WMS space, it really hasn't taken off in the last, you know, call it three or four years. Greg, did you want to add anything or call yeah, it? Just, just a couple on two of them on the more frequent upgrades for the disadvantage from a WMS standpoint. And Brad kind of hit on it. There are typically more extensions or modifications in a WMS application than there are TMS. So with all these frequent upgrades, and we talk about regression testings, keep a sharp eye on automated testing tools, right? So the rinse and repeat cycles that have to be looked at uh, consistently on a versionless type implementation. So there's some automated testing tools out there that make it a lot easier that will help alleviate some of the pain that comes with that versionless or more frequent upgrades. And then the other one is the, the transitioning from cloud to microservices deliver the functional parity. So really boils it down to is the, a lot of these companies who are leaping from a perpetual to a cloud or a SaaS solution are spending the R&D dollars to make that accomplishment. And what they're not doing is spending those R&D dollars to bring that new solution up to parity with what the old solution provided. They're trying, they're getting there. So keep a sharp eye out on the feature function parity between transitioning from an on-prem solution to a SaaS solution. Well, I know Great firsthand point. that I have uh, bled all over the field. Um, you know, going to a cloud-based WMS, you ask, you know, what's your, uh, you know, organization's experience with cloud? They're like, yeah, we got cloud, we got salesforce.com and we got Workday. And we're like, okay, those are offline planning tools. It's okay, you can update somebody's, you know, account or HR tomorrow. In a blue collar supply chain execution world, if things don't ship, people usually lose their jobs. So, you know, even three years ago, we saw about 50% of our projects still going on-prem I want the box in the corner knowing that I got a backup because I need to ship stuff on a daily basis. In the last three years, we've seen a lot of people transition to cloud, but their organization, wait, now I need a, you know, a second cloud provider. I need to do my own BI tool offline, multi-tenant, hidden transactions, jobs running behind the scenes. So I truly believe multi-tenant WMS is new. There's a lot of vendors out there offering it. They're, they're starting to, you know, punch through the ceiling on some complexity and scale. And so, you know, we're going to see more changes as that comes along. All right. So the other big topic we always talk about, best of breed versus ERP. So, you know, Greg, give us a little perspective on what you're seeing out there. Yeah. So when we talk best of breed, what we're really talking about is a point solution from a vendor or provider. That is their sole focus, right? They've got a dedicated industry R&D. They're on top of it. They like to convert from bleeding edge to leading, leading edge very quickly. And really what their focus is, is specialized functionality. So when we do these deep dive requirements gathering and we tell them that every, every other Tuesday they have to do a half twist back flip when they're receiving from a vendor that provides this, right? So all that really deep knowledge and the ability to flex and scale to do that is key. And this is what best of breeds are, are, are really, really good at. They're also really good at the implementation timeline, right? It's bread and butter to them. They get up, they do it. That's what they put their boots on in the morning to do. So really it's speed to value. And then the other side of it on the disadvantage is kind of the data fragmentation where you don't have one system that has all the data incorporated. So a lot, a lot of times there's duplicate interfaces, there are duplicate item masters, and those can provide integration challenges as well. From the ERP-based monolithic solutions, the advantages are a shared database. An item is an item is an item is an item across the enterprise. So it makes that snapshot of inventory, it makes that snapshot of item dimensions, the critical things that you need to make decisions quickly. 
also the WMS and TMS combined into one R&D. When they upgrade something or they update the R&D or the feature function in one, oftentimes it trails or it accentuates the other solution, right? And then there's a lower implementation cost. You've got one solution, one set of databases, and it streamlines a lot of the processes. On the disadvantage side, we talk about you know, how wide is your pool and how deep is it, right? So they might have a they ha may have a wide variety of feature functions, but they just don't go very deep. You can only do so many things. And what most of them say and most of their action items are is if it's not in base, that's the way it's going to be. You don't have as many options for enhancements as you do in a best of breed. Ergo, they're less, they're less focused on the specialized needs. So those would be what I would say would be the top couple best of breed advantage and disadvantage and the top couple multi-purpose or ERPs advantage and disadvantage. So Brad and I had this conversation yesterday, you know, there's probably a, a few ERPs out there that claim they have a TMS and we, we think that there's only one, um, <laughs> unless you're in the, uh, the, the grain and the seed industry. Um, <coughs> There might be a two, but uh, that, that's interesting. On the flip side, you know, we know that uh, Navision or um, what is NetSuite has now created an advanced WMS and D365 has an advanced WMS and SAP EWM. But even then, some of those aren't fully integrated. You still have to do some integration work, even though it comes from the same vendor. All right. So let's talk a little bit about, right, what, when you say monolithic, right, we got ERP with best of breed. What, we're talking about a different type of architecture, right? And so depending on the legacy and the history and where the company was, where they're at, where they're going, let's get everybody on the same page. Brad, this is a great topic for you. Help us out, understand a little bit about the differences. Yeah, so within the TMS market, we, we generally group them into uh, two different architectural categories. There's monolithic, uh, and the way that we define monolithic uh, is really think of a, an application that's all on the same data schema. It's like the same database. Um, and all of the individual components are essentially tightly tied to that, to that data schema. <clears throat> um, so anytime uh, a software vendor makes a change to a specific module or function that hits that database in a monolithic architecture, uh, everything else has to get regression tested, updated as well. Um, there are some advantages from a, a software vendor perspective on keeping uh, their applications in a monolithic architecture. It's, it's usually easier to kind of control and scale. Uh, you've got one code base as opposed to multiple. Uh, but from a shipper perspective, the, the buyer of the TMS technology, monolithic tends to be a little bit uh, cumbersome. Right. If if you have uh, think of a small to medium sized shipper that buys a tier one TMS, they're getting a tremendous amount of bloat, things and features and technology uh, that they don't necessarily ever have any use for. <clears throat> With uh, a different microservices architecture, they can kind of leg in feature by feature, capability by capability. And as they add those new capabilities, then they don't necessarily have to pick up and redo the whole platform, retest it. So that's kind of some of the differences between monolithic versus microservices. And microservices architecturally is where we see most of the tier ones and uh, th that's where they're going. And the, the new entrants to the market really in the past, let's say three to five years, have started with a, a microservices code base. So the easiest way to think about microservices is to think about like amazon.com or Netflix, right? You, you see these new improvements that come out. Uh, you don't have to like redo the entire application. They're making small micro changes to the back end because it's very componentized. And instead of everything sitting on the same data schema, they're, they're actually sitting on essentially an, an integration layer uh, through these REST APIs. <clears throat> so the API structure kind of gives these modules uh, kind of a plug and play and a, a kind of an easier, more logical streamlined path for a shipper, the, the buyer of that technology, to kind of get a leg into new capabilities without having to redo the entire application design or from a, an upgrade perspective, 
you know, you can test one small little function without having to re regression test everything else because that hasn't changed, right? So it it is good. It's a net positive for our shippers. But Greg Greg mentioned the technology debt. Um, so when we talk about with our shippers during a blueprint process, technology and the architecture, we're really trying to make sure that they understand that if they end up going with a monolithic or an application that is architected for like client server, but now it's moved to the cloud and it's hosted software as a service, at some point in time, there's a high probability that that software vendor is going to have to migrate to a more modern architecture. When they make those changes, all the R&D spend goes to re-architecting and it gets sucked up by, uh, you know, the move in the architecture as opposed to, hey, I want this new feature. I want to do, you know, multi-leg routes through my cross docs. Well, you can't have that for the next five years because we're we're busy re-architecting. So that's the, that's the debt that Greg was mentioning that we see a lot in this stage in 2023 with the tier one TMS vendors. Very cool. So we got a now foundation, right? So we've talked a little bit about the WMS TMS foundation. We talked a little bit about cloud. You know, we talked about, right, you got four assets, space equipment, labor, and then that one is control. And that control happens inside the four walls, outside the four walls. And in the beginning, we talked a little bit about a gray area. Some of the functionalities in the WMS, some of the functionality lives and breathes in the TMS. And so let's talk a little bit about the best practices for inbound. And, um, you know, Greg and I were very fortunate earlier in our careers that we both had the opportunity to work with an organization that predominantly was 90% truckload, right? So in a 90% truckload environment, you want to optimize your transportation, drop it to the warehouse and let the warehouse execute, but knowing that you're doing it at the TMS level. On the flip side, if you're 90% parcel and maybe 5% LTL, 5% truckload, you might actually drop your orders into the warehouse, maximize your space equipment and labor within the four walls, and then you know deal with the transportation after the orders are picked or when the orders are released to the floor, you're capturing that. So you know there's no rhyme or reason. That's one thing we love about supply chain. It's more of an art and a science, like what's important to each customer and how you guys are doing it. But let's talk a little bit about the gray areas and some of the best practices for inbound. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take on the WMS side, and that's a great lead in, Michael, and it really, a lot of it depends on where they're at today and where they want to get to. I would tell you that a lot of the customers that we deal with today have just because they've done it in the past been a WMS-driven model, right? And I, I'll let Brad chime in when the time is right, but what we're finding is when we open up that umbrella and we ask ourselves, why are we doing that? the prevalence that we're seeing today is driving more towards a TMS driven model. There's some industries that don't prescribe to that for great reasons, but for the most part, a lot of our customers are looking at more of a TMS driven model to get more value out of the asset. And you can kind of tell from this slide, and I'm not gonna drain these, where the overlaps are between WMS and TMS. So if we're talking about putting in dual role architecture, supply chain, software replacements, where you're talking about both, these are the areas where you have to make that decision, who's gonna drive this and what's the best system to drive it. So taking that out of the mix from the inbound side of it, other than those circled where it's TMS integration and who's gonna do it, some of the key things that you really wanna take advantage of if the opportunity presents itself is make use of your ASNs, speed up your receipts, get them in the door, get them received, get them ready to be put away. Use of a YMS, this could be dictated based upon how many assets you've got in the yard, how many trailers, Sometimes it's a plus, sometimes it's a minus. So you need to understand that. One of the things that we really drive home is a dock to stock KPI. How long has it been sitting on your dock before it gets put away and it's saleable? WMSs provide the ability to sell product while it's in receiving, not yet put away. That's a tough thing to do when you're at, you know, when you're looking for a pallet of Clorox and it's buried in the middle of your dock, right? So keep in mind that dock to stock KPI. I can tell you without pause that. We have been in a lot of customers within the last 12 to 18 months that are completely full for various reasons. They may have overbought because of COVID. Now the stuff's showing up, right? So that dock to stock is really important. And really an all, all department collaboration. 
forward buys are not a thing of the past, believe it or not. They still happen today. Merchandisers want to buy stuff and they buy freight at a, at a reduced cost. But what's the payback on the distribution side? So when you have everybody collaborating within, within the organization, how much to buy and when to buy it, that's an important feature. The other one I want to really talk about is cross dock timing, taking advantage of freight that's coming in the door and leveraging it to go out the door as quickly as possible so you don't have to store it, put it away, pull it, pick it, pack it, ship it. So most WMS provides cross dock today, but again, it's a timing. When do I, when do I allocate that and how can I take advantage of my inbound freight? Asset utilization, take advantage of the people that are coming in the floor and that really comes along with smoothing, right? Make sure that you're using the assets that you own. And then lastly, the backhaul opportunities that exist for inbound. Where can I get value of the trucks that are on the road so I'm not being burdened with empty travel? Brad, what about the TMS, buddy? Yeah, I think I would I would echo what, what you said, Greg, and I would kind of uh, summarize it by saying integration for the purpose of synchronization uh, is is really what we're talking about here, right? So the the four items that we circled on on inbound TMS are are I think best practices in terms of how we integrate with a WMS or or other uh, kind of upstream systems to make sure that things are synchronized, right? And and we have a lot of clients uh, in the past two years asking us both for inbound and outbound help our transportation plans smooth out the labor. Uh, uh, volatility in the DC, right? We have visibility to, to uh, items that are in transit uh, that the WMS doesn't necessarily have. Maybe it's dependent on ASN quality if we have ASNs at all, uh, but we have that real-time tracking visibility on the TMS side that can be a big benefit to the WMS from a labor planning uh, perspective. So those are some of the new things that we're starting to see on, on the inbound side, but I think the uh, the challenges and the complexity are, are definitely on the outbound. I know firsthand, I've, I've been to many places where on Monday, they need nine people in receiving and put away. But on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they only need three. So why not just smooth out your inbound throughout the whole week to give a team of, you know, two or three a full day versus, you you know, you've got nine people on Monday. Or the flip side is if you know your industry you need it on Monday, that's great. But then have them cross train, don't have every, you know nine nine people on inbound. And then the yeah. other part of it is that backdoor scheduling, right? So you know what we see nine times out of ten is productivity starts at the dock. So if you don't have enough dock doors, you don't have enough inbound staging, it impacts the overall productivity with inside the four walls. So working outside the four walls, know what's coming in, ASNs, appointment scheduling, you can plan and level load your day inside the four walls. All right, so now we got the best practices for inbound. Uh, let's go to best practices for outbound. And again, for those of you that are on, we have the chat and the QA, feel free to put questions in. We'll get Brad and Greg to answer them as we're going along here. All right, so on the outbound, what are we looking at? Yeah, so for the WMS, Michael mentioned it. This is really where the mo rubber meets the road. So your, your world revolves around servicing your customers and the SLAs that you've got in place. Now you've got the stuff, how do I get it back out the door? And again, it reflects back to the WMS or TMS driven process. Who's gonna do that? How can I best serve my customer? And I think that's really the answer is how do I best serve my customer? But to do that effectively is taking your sales orders or your push orders, whatever industry that you're in and deliver and smooth those deliveries. Michael mentioned peaks and valleys. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays are heavy. Tuesdays and Thursdays are light. Well, why is that? Is it just because you've done that that way for so long? Take a long look at what your delivery cycles look like, what your delivery schedules look like, because the opportunity in the WMS is to do allocations and order wave templates make it much easier for you today to pick and choose what types of orders and how much order allocation you want to put out there. Number one, to keep your people, your assets, whether it's material handling assets or people assets busy to make sure that you're getting freight out the door. I'll mention crosstalk once again. Take advantage of those crosstalk opportunities from an inbound side of, side of it to make sure that you're satisfying your outbound side of it. And the whole goal really is to keep them busy. The last key thing that I'll tell you about that, that is really important that we see every day is cartonization. Use a sophisticated cartonization routine to get your freight out the door. If it's pallets, that's a little bit different. But when you're picking to a case or you're picking cases or you're picking parcel into outbound, make sure that you've got the critical dimensions in place. That serves and feeds the TMS 
and it also serves and feeds the WMS. So you're picking the appropriate quantity, you're picking it to the appropriate outbound container or movable unit ID, whatever you want to call it, to make sure that you're making best time of your full-time equivalents, picking and productivity. Then make sure that you got the right stuff on the right truck. Every package out there today provides for some type of RF loading, whether it's whether it's through an inline scanner, whether it's through hand, a handheld device, leaving a pallet on the dock for a customer should never happen. You end up hot shotting it or tail loading it onto another load that it shouldn't go on. And it's really all about timing. Get the stuff in the door on time and on value and get the stuff out the door on time and on value so you meet or exceed your SLAs for your customer. Brad, how about you, bud? I would just, I would kind of say the, the, the key thing that I, uh, talk with my clients about is really um, almost every event that happens in the warehouse uh, should be reflected somehow in the TMS, right? Many of our clients want to smooth uh, labor to the DC, so the TMS has to be in lockstep with the WMS. Um, our, our clients want to what we call continuous plan uh, so just because a, a, a load has been passed over to the WMS that may be 70% full of a trailer uh, doesn't mean that it's, uh, you know, done. We'd like to continue to add additional outbound orders to that trailer to maximize my utilization. All of these things require very tight integration with the WMS. So I think this is where I would really encourage and try to educate the shippers to uh, uh, kind of look at integration and tightening the integration between the WMS and the TMS um, during, during the implementation, if not sooner, during the conceptual design. Excellent. So, you know, when I think about cartonization, um, there's two sides of that equation. One, obviously for parcel, picking directly into the right size outbound carton. But two, when you're doing truckload, you know, putting that weight over the axles and how you're actually gonna maximize that trailer. So you know, cartonization does have an impact on both sides and, and two different degrees. Yep. So um, first and foremost, I want to understand we had a technical glitch. We have fixed it. So now the uh, the chat and the QA was disabled. I was like, man, how do we not have any questions? Usually we get tons of questions coming in. So the chat and QA are, are now fixed. So please feel free to uh, put some questions out there for us. So tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them what you told them and then tell them what you told them. So um, the key takeaways, right? So there are a number of TMS and WMS vendors. Selections are not easy, right? So we understand that's a tough thing to do. Um, we believe that the blueprint approach, thinking with the end of mind, understanding exactly what resources are required for how long, helping us understand those unique requirements, putting your shopping list together out there is really going to help before you begin the project to execute flawlessly. Another part was the on-prem versus cloud, right? So believe it or not, TMS has been in the cloud since 2000. 23 years later, we're starting to see the WMS coming along. And there's still some, you know, um, lessons learned happening along the way. Types of architecture, uh, as well as best of breed and ERP. So believe it or not, we don't think there's really any ERPs that offer a, a best of breed TMS functional, except for one. Uh, they bought it. And then the others, um, you know, obviously best of breed has, has the right capabilities on the TMS side. On the ERP side, uh, there are a few that have a WMS and depending on, is it good enough? Are you willing to, you know, go and build an integration to best of breed or can you live with the one that's, that's with your ERP? Talked about the types of architecture, monolithic, microservices, open, the microservices, regression testing tool, obviously a, a hand in glove scenario there. And then we talked about some best practices. So based on your industry, we're gonna have some best practices on the TMS, best practices on the WMS. Okay, we got a couple of questions here. So uh, let's jump into that. So Brad, you talk about this blueprint approach. What's the biggest aha when you do a TMS blueprint that you and your team have found over the last 20 years? And by the way, congratulations, happy birthday on JBF. <laughs> Thank you. I would say the, um, the, the biggest takeaway is usually uh, uh, the, the, the breadth or complexity of, of not all of these features or capabilities that I'm looking for as the shipper uh, exist in a, uh, you know, tier one TMS, right? And uh, there's, there's an ecosystem approach that, that we like to take. And I'll, I'll, use, I'll use an example. 
we have a, a client that's uh, essentially a wholesale food uh, a, a, a distributor, uh, but they also have a, a, a retail grocery arm. They have a brokerage arm. They're a for hire trucking company. So a blueprint for a company like that uh, could theoretically include uh, four different TMSs. You need a trucking TMS, you need a brokerage TMS, you need a, a, a food distributor routing and scheduling fleet application uh, with driver pay capabilities, and you also need a, you know, a, a for hire normal TMS. So doing a blueprint can really open up the eyes of the buyer in terms of, oh, I didn't know I was asking for all of those things, but there's actually, uh, you know, four different types of vendors that we need to go to RFP for, and our universe of RFP responses is now 30 vendors. So it becomes a lot more complicated based on where they want their future state capabilities to be. Um, I would also say that uh, it, it is one of the challenges uh, that one of our, our latest blueprints uh, went through was, was really about... Um, international transportation, international logistics is very different than domestic, you know, for import export, if you're a, a retailer, or if you're a, you know, a kind of a, a large industrial company that does a lot of uh, intra regional freight moves, you do a lot of import and export, those processes, those functions, those uh, systems are radically different from the ones that a, a North America outbound consumer product shipper might be looking at. So just because it exists in the top right quadrant of, of Gartner's magic quadrant, doesn't mean that those are the three vendors that you should go to RFP with. You need to do your homework up front. Otherwise it could be a multi-million dollar mistake. And that's well, what we're trying to help clients avoid. Okay. So don't scare everybody. Not everybody needs four <laughs> TMS, right? It's that's, that's true. Like the worst possible environment imaginable: sure. international yeah. brokerage, routing, and domestic. Yeah. Okay, so not everybody's in that. Not everybody checks that box. Some people, it's just a simple one TMS will solve the answer. Yeah. Don't freak them out. All right, now Greg, coming over to you, right? So you and your team are out there. You guys are doing you know, business cases, ROI, discovery, uncovering unique requirements. As you guys work with your, you know, customers out there, what's the biggest aha as part of this, you know, discovery blueprint process? Yep. So it's actually a little bit easier than Brad's on the TMS side. Fortunately, you know, the majority of the WMS providers are out there have great feature functionality. I would say that most of them satisfy 90 plus percent of the requirements that we define and we get out of the deep dive design. But what really jumps out of this every time is they haven't thought ahead about what it's going to take to stand this up and turn it on successfully. We call that client side responsibilities. The vendors don't do a great job of saying, by the way, people, you're gonna need this body that does this and this body that does that, testing, training, UAT, SIT, work instructions, SOPs. And it's not until late in the game till they figure that out. And it's not a multi-million dollar mistake, but what it does lead to is an extended implementation timeline, right? It, 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 it comes down to now I know I do need help. I waited too long and the red flag goes up. It says, we can't proceed. Our go, no go decision was thumbs down because we haven't UAT'd all the critical steps in the, in, the, in the scripts. So without pause, it would be the aha, meaning they haven't thought far enough in advance to make sure that they've got the right number of folks and the right type of folks to complete the implementation process. Excellent. We got a, uh, another question here and I'll read it. And then Brad and Greg, you guys can figure out. Have the planning windows changed with the microservices approach? For example, in the past, a company would waive orders once a day and the TMS planning would mirror that, but could it be some other time frame? what rises uh, to the top as a best practice? Yeah, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that to start, Greg. You can uh, jump in too, but <clears throat> from my perspective, the, the different uh, TMS architecture hasn't really influenced greatly uh, the planning horizons or the windows in, in terms of uh, uh, what the, what that that question seemed to be alluding to. That's really a, an implementation design uh, challenge. It's not a technical limitation. 
it's usually a process or a policy decision in terms of how many waves are, uh, are, are, are done per day. And I would agree. I, I would add on to that. Back in the day, one wave a day was pretty good because you could plan your entire day and know that you needed 11 people in picking and 12 and put away or whatever it is. By chunking up those waves in today's real-time world, you're able to take advantage of near real-time, just-in-time inventory inbound. So what was out at 10 o'clock in the morning and you didn't have shows up at 1130. Rather than do cross-dock, you can take advantage of more timed, timed wave releases. Yeah, and, and I think what we've seen is a hybrid, right? Waveless, wave, non um, e-commerce. It can still, you know, take orders until five and make the the parcel, uh, you know, shipping at six. So, you know, opportunity, wave early, get your LTL, wave later, get your TL, and then, you know, drop the uh, parcel IV drip, try and batch them up inside the four walls. Awesome. All right. So uh, we're coming towards the end here. I think the big thing for us is, uh, you know, what's the takeaway, right? So there is a TMS and WMS buyer's guide, um, both uh, at the JBF site and the Alpine site to help you uh, navigate this process. And uh, don't forget, we've got our summer off, but we come back for appetite of construction, uh, where you locate your distribution center matters more than you think. So we'll have uh, some examples of distribution network analysis, looking at your inbound outbound transportation. Where should the DC be based on cost and service level? And then I want to, you know, uh, thank again our uh, our uh, uh, outside guest here, Brad. Thank you so much for your partnership and and taking the time today. And Greg, it's always good to hear from you. For those of you on the call, thank you so much. We will be sending this out. And we will be sharing the results with everybody. And uh, we thank you for investing your time today with JBF and Alpine. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.